Welcome back. Eddie Radosovich, George Stoya here from the Soonerscoop.com offices in the Soonerscoop.com studio. There's a lot of Sooner Scoop there. I just want to get that yeah. in the algorithm so everybody kind of knows. But uh, welcome back. We uh, went to practice. I almost said it. I almost said the O word and I stopped myself. I'm really proud. This is a proud moment for me. We were out at practice on Monday. We did the show on Monday. We talked to players on Tuesday. So let's just jump in. Uh, we won't be going back out to practice until next week. Next Monday is our next viewing session. But we did talk to Dylan Gabriel. And, you know, I think that that's where we want to start, George. Let's talk Oklahoma offensively. Yep. After talking to uh, Dylan Gabriel on Tuesday, there's a lot out there. Obviously, they're – give me a break. <laughs> There's a lot out there as far as Oklahoma offensive line coming together. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk about the running backs. We'll get into maybe a little bit of that here yeah. shortly. But let's start with QB1, yeah. Dylan Gabriel. Yeah, no, I mean, I, he's always interesting to talk to. I think that he's a guy that, you know, was someone that last year had some ups and downs, right? I mean, it was one of those things that he he was struggling at times. I mean, he, I keep wanting to say obviously, Eddie. I'm so close to saying obviously. Um, I but, believe in you. Be strong. Know, Be trying. strong. We, we, we're not putting any money we, in that GD tip I, jar or whatever you want to say. We're trying to keep it under five today. We're already at one from you. But uh, but yeah, no, I, I think he's a guy that when we talk to him in the media, he's always very kind of quiet, but he's a guy that you can tell is growing some confidence. I wrote about it yesterday. He's becoming more of a leader. I think it was Jalil Farouk, and we'll get to some of those guys here in a minute, but he was the one that says, hey, he feels way more confident. He's becoming a leader of that group. And now, does that fix things on the field? We'll see. Um, that's to be determined, but He's definitely a guy that I think just listening to him, he's much more comfortable in not only the system that they're running, but being that guy that that OU needs to look to. And and again, we talked about it a lot, situational football, winning close games, going on a drive to win a game. Can he be that guy? And it feels like he's kind of stepped into that role a little bit more here. Let's start right there. Jalil Farouk on Dylan Gabriel going into his second season in Norman. Uh, it's a big difference. Uh, Dylan's way more confident, way more, way more of a leader. He's just coming aggressive. He's taking over the team. So I'm excited to play with him this year for sure. Do you feel like, I don't know, last year, even the bowl game, like something kind of clicked yeah, with him and the team? And definitely. Everything? Definitely. I feel like he got his swagger back for sure. Uh, as you know, it's hard for a QB coming in a new, a new offense and things like that. So I know it was especially a new team, a new environment and everything. So I know it was a lot on his plate. He had a lot of a lot of weight on his shoulders. So he started to get his swagger by. I know he got it now, so I can't wait for him to showcase it. It's not going to happen overnight for Dylan Gabriel. He's right. going to have to play better. And especially, I think, at the early portion of the season. It's something that we've talked about time and time again as far as this offense moving forward. They need to kind of get out of the gates early. And, you know, you have the Arkansas State game. You have SMU. You have Tulsa. You have plenty of opportunity there Iowa State Cincinnati before that Texas game which I think a lot of people have circled in the sixth game of the year that it seems like Oklahoma's offense needs to start kind of they need to be moving in the right direction right yeah no definitely and I think when you look at Dylan especially is that's that's where he's got to come to life right because we saw it last year they were not able to score against Texas and you look at those first five opponents and those should be games they win and and I think SMU could be a tough opponent, right? They're going to probably be able to put up some points. Uh, that's a good offense. They've got some nice players there. Yeah, Since Preston it, Preston Stone, the Preston former Stone. five-star quarterback. I mean, I, they've got some good players, some transfers that they got in the portal. So I think that that could be a little bit of a battle where you got to score some points. Iowa State, who knows what's going to happen with them. Cincinnati, I, I don't think it's going to be great, but it's a good road test. But that Texas game, you know you're going to have to score points against Texas. And so that's where you kind of want to see it turn on. And I think it's prob probably also in the back of Dylan's mind, right? He didn't get to play in that game last year I'm sure he wants a little bit of revenge kind of show what he's worth in that game actually play in it uh, kind of feel that atmosphere but definitely I, I think that that's where the offense really has to start hitting their stride and then you talk about the back half of the season so that's where the inner the conversation kind of gets interesting I think that you know there's a lot to like about Dylan Gabriel yep. I mean we're going to get into the stats here in a second he's racing up the uh, the all-time passing charts in college football let's jump back to Jeff Lebby a week ago, talking about, or two weeks ago, talking about, could he become a top 10 all-time college passer in college football? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. You can put a little more on Dylan. And again, he's he's now played a ton of ball. And this is a guy that, you know, stay healthy. He's going to go, I mean, I, I would like to think he's going to be a top 10 passer in the history of college football. You know, and that's 
that's something that, uh, that that matters. You know, he's going to have a ton of production. He's had a bunch of production. He's got to play better. I got to call it better. We've said that. Um, but that guy allows you to put a lot on the entire unit because he's played a whole bunch of ball. So I think that that was something that it, it caught a lot of people off guard. I know that we've talked about it here on the YouTube show just as far as that was one of those things. It's like, wait a second, how far up the list is he? On Tuesday, we had the opportunity to talk to Dylan Gabriel. And that was kind of one of my questions I wanted to ask him was, do you feel undervalued as a college football player in the current times? Do you feel like you're undervalued just overall in the grand scheme of the college football this year? Uh, fortunately, none of that matters. You know, it's just uh, the, the name of the game. This is the ultimate team sport, and that's all I'm focused on, winning, having fun with my brothers. You know, sometimes, you know, just keeping it simple and, and maintaining that uh, – the rest will take care of itself. So for me, man, uh, finding ways to go one and zero every week—that's that's what uh, you know keeps everyone happy. It's one of the all-time. You know, what's he supposed to say? He answered right. it the right way. He answered it as you would expect a leader to do, yep. and say that it's about team wins. It's about bouncing back from a six and seven season. It's about him playing better. And I think that they all kind of go hand in hand. You, I think, tweeted about this, but I just for perspective. He threw for 3,653 yards as a freshman. He threw for 35 or 3,570 yards as a sophomore. And then the injury shortened junior season in yep. Orlando only played three games, 814 yards on top of the 3,168 yards a year ago. So George, he needs what? It's 2,874 yards to jump into that top 10 just for perspective Case Keenum's number one all time, 19,217 yards. Timmy Chang, the great Hawaiian quarterback, 17,072 yards. The number that kind of sticks out to me, 95 touchdowns over the last four seasons. Now, it, you have to put that into perspective, obviously, because there's not a whole lot of quarterbacks that have played as much football uh, as Dylan Gabriel has. Yep. But at the same time, I do think the conversation's worth having that, you know, with Oklahoma and the quarterback success that they've had with Baker and Kyler and Jalen Hurts, it, Oklahoma fans became spoiled at the quarterback position. It's kind of one of those things for me, though. Do Oklahoma fans really know what they have in Dylan Gabriel, especially the really good Dylan Gabriel that we've seen at times? Right. It feels like we're going back in time to like 2012 talking about Landry Jones. Like that's the kind of con and I don't know if people want to hear that. Right. Because I know there's sure. some back and forth on on what Landry 16,646 yards for uh, Landry. Third all time. Third all time. Baker Mayfield on that list as well. Seventh all time at. 14,607 yards. And I think Dylan can catch Baker. I think I've said that. I mean, if he throws for, I think, around 32, 3,300 yards, he'll be right there with Baker, which is crazy to think about that he's in that same conversation. And I, and I mentioned Landry because I think that's what category he's in. Is he's just played a lot of college football. And Landry was a good player. He won, you know, most years, 10, 11 games for Oklahoma. Now, is he going to lead you to a national championship? I just, I don't buy that with Dylan Gabriel. Can he win 9, 10, 11 games this year and compete for a Big 12 championship and maybe win a Big 12 championship? I think so. And and I know that everybody's looking at the stats and saying, oh, wow, that's crazy. He could finish top 10. But to me, I, I don't care if he throws for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 yards this year. Can he get it done on, on fourth and short, third and short? Those were the areas that Oklahoma just wasn't good enough last year. And some of that was his fault, right? He missed throws. He was inaccurate at times. And some of it was maybe play calling. And, and so that's where you want to see the improvement. And I think Dylan knows that. And he kind of said that in his answer. He said, hey, we got to go win football games. It's not about finishing top 10, which would be an awesome accolade. And I'm sure 10 years from now, he'd look back and say, wow, what, what an accomplishment. But I think he's more focused on, hey, we, we need to, to get better at the details going forward. And I know that that's been something that, I mean, Drake Stoops talked about, Jalil Farouk, Jeff Lebby has talked a ton about it. Uh, that's what they focused on in the spring. They did a lot of different situational stuff. They've been doing a lot of two-minute offense type, type stuff. Uh, and that's what they're focusing on right now early in fall camp. Just for perspective, Dylan Gabriel currently 69th overall. Yep. Nice. 11,205 yards. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely within range yeah. and you would hope that there's a natural progression as there's a, you know, not a lot of guys returning, but you have Jalil Farouk, you have Drake Stoops. And I think most importantly, you have Jeff Levy and Dylan Gabriel for a second year. Jeff Levy talked about it on Monday. We talked to the offensive coordinator. We kind of discussed that. We went over a little bit of what he was talking about with the wide receivers and yep. just everything that's coming together there with all the guys that are out there. This is, you're going to hear from Jeff Levy 
as well as Dylan Gabriel and Drake Stoops as they enter that second season. I think it's just guys understanding what the expectation is. We've got a lot more guys in the room and on the practice field today uh, than we did a year ago today that understand what the strain needs to look like. And we've got good bodies in the room, uh, in the receiver room, again, in the running back room, in the tight end room. We got guys that maybe aren't the first ones that are stepping out there, but they can play at a really high level, and that's the expectation. You know, regardless of who's in the game, being able to play at a high level, and, and our guys have taken that and and uh, run with it. Yeah, it's kind of like you know when you get a girlfriend, and you know for three months you're still learning each other, but once you get to that year, year and a half, you you kind of loosen up and being able to, you know, just get to know them more. So, likewise with our you know relationships, you know, off the field and on the field. Just being around them more, knowing how we communicate, um, certain routes we like, how to throw them. Likewise, how you know routes that they like to catch. Um, just, I think with time, that can only benefit everyone. Uh, yeah, I think just in, uh, as the whole team in general, being able to being able to uh, have a whole year under our, uh, some of the older guys, some of the vets, some of the older guys on the team having a whole year under the system, defense and offense, both of them. Um, last year was kind of fresh still, even only being there six months through spring ball and everything. So now going into year two, I think everyone's playing a little faster, has a better understanding of schemes and stuff like that, which allows us to play more free and, and faster, like I said. So I definitely feel like uh, that definitely helps just getting some experience under your belt coming back here year two. The girlfriend quote kills me. That's yep. a that's a pretty good comparison. I, I was going to pipe can't in. can't relate. I, no. I was going to pipe in that I never get past three days, let alone three, yep. maybe sometimes three minutes yeah. with somebody. But uh, it, it does kind of relate to everything that's going on with Oklahoma. There is a sense of comfort there. I think just, you know, you mentioned it at the top, just talking to him, it seems like he's pretty comfortable in his own skin right now as the quarterback at Oklahoma, which... It's not for everybody. Yeah. No, and I think it's – yeah, I even go back to Brent talking about it being an 18-month process since he's taken the head coaching job, and I think that that speaks to the players as well. I mean, we, we, we've talked a ton about it on defense, feeling more comfortable with the playbook. I think you see it on offense too. I mean, Jeff Lebby runs – um, you know, a pretty difficult offense. This isn't an easy thing to just learn overnight. And, and Dylan's been in the system, right? But it's a little bit different. And, and you know, Drake talked about learning, you know, uh, the different skill sets of all the receivers. And, and that's what Dylan's been focused on most is trying to figure that out. Because obviously he loses the guy in Marvin Mims last year who was who was the leading receiver um, and was kind of his go-to guy. So now he's all of a sudden got to build up a new rapport with some of these new guys. So I think that that's something that, you know, again, just being more comfortable with the guys, and and I think Dylan, you could even see it when he's leading the group and breaking down the warmups, uh, talking to guys in between drills. He just, you can tell people look up to him and they they point to him as the leader of this team, and uh, I think that that's going to be huge for this group going forward and just the relationships that they build. Something that I will throw out there sounds like Andre Anthony's having a really good camp, yep. and you know when he comes in from Michigan with a lot of these transfers, it's kind of one of those situations that you just don't know where everything's at you know that he's really fast you see the you know the one highlight that he had up in east lansing breaking off i think it was like a 75 80 yard yeah. touchdown uh reception off I, I think it was a screen pass even but it's seems like it's coming together and you just need a couple of those guys to be really good for him well yeah and i think you, you hear the names uh right you, you hear jalil farouk you hear drake stoops they're having good camps but then all of a sudden you're right. You hear other names like an Andrew Anthony, a Jaden Gibson keeps coming up. It seems like he's getting a lot of um, hype this 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 camp. And then you've got uh, Petaway, the freshman. We've talked a ton about him on here. So it sounds like he's starting to build those relationships with those guys. They want to play a lot of guys at that position. So it's on Dylan to kind of build those relationships because it is all about an understanding skill set, where they like the ball, how to throw it to them. Some guys are faster, some guys are taller, those sorts of things. Uh, and that's usually worked out in camp. Gavin Freeman also yeah, in that Gavin mix Freeman. for sure. Uh, you know, and that's somebody that we've talked about, I think, basically almost every time that we yeah. talk to Brent Venables. Probably more than anybody name. else. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, the wide receiver position is something that, you know, over the next 24 days, obviously there's going to be a lot of people yeah. that watch it. I'm sorry. I, 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 just, I don't four. know. I, I don't know. Four, we're going to we're gonna stay strong. We're going to stay strong. Hey, Peter Millar, give me a call, by the way. I'm trying to get new threads. One of the guys that is in his first year at Oklahoma is Walter Rouse. And, mm -hmm. you know, he misses spring because of the shoulder injury. We did talk to him on Monday about getting back out on the football field. 
I mean, uh, shoulder feels great, um, a lot better than I expected it to, uh, to be. Um, and honestly, I was just, you know, from the first day to now, I feel like I've been, you know, getting better every single day, you know, improving just a little bit and just, I'm honestly just having fun. You know, I haven't been able to hit somebody in about eight months. So, you know, I remember that first hit I had in the inside on, uh, on Thursday. I was like, okay, we're back now. So uh, I've had a fun time and my, my shoulder's feeling pretty good. So really good news there. Yeah. Getting Walter Rouse back, he's going to be the starting left tackle barring any type of, you know, God forbid, any type of injury because that position isn't very deep when you're replacing Wanya Moore as you're replacing Anton Harrison. It sounds like everything, you know, with Tyler Guyton, I know that Josh McQuichan has been really high on what he could be uh, you know, maybe even in this draft coming yep. up. Uh, it, it, how do you see that starting offensive line kind of working itself together? Yeah, no, I mean, I think we kind of have an idea of who it's going to be, right? It sounds like Rouse at left tackle, Bird at left guard, Raym at center, Matoire at right guard. I know Jake Taylor uh, seems to be kind of pushing for maybe for one of those guard spots, and then Guyton, obviously, at right tackle. So um, there was another, obviously. But anyways, you know, I, I, I feel really good about that offensive line, actually. I, I think I wrote in my mailbag this week, it's a group that – I think could surprise a lot of people. It, it might be a group that we look up and four of those guys are getting drafted. Um, maybe not Bird next year, but four of those guys I think have the potential to be drafted maybe other than Matoire. And, and there's been a lot of talk about him having a really good offseason. So I like that group a lot, and I know that you asked Dylan about it too. Yeah, that was something that I uh, I, I actually I, I wanted to kind of go with the idea of something basically off the Crimson Corner as far as who's surprising in camp that we're not talking about. And this was Dylan Gabriel's answer. I'm going to just say the O-line unit as a whole. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, put the cart before the horse, but those guys are playing their butt off, and I'm proud of them. And, you know, every day they just compete, and they're really smart um, just in everything they do. So that group as a whole is, is some it's a, it's a bunch of guys I've been impressed with. So it's kind of one of those things. I, you know, it, it's good to hear that about the offensive line. Yeah. He's kind of backing him up. He's, he's the leader of the team. But you just ran over the starting offensive line. There is maybe a little bit of a depth issue there, uh, you know, certainly at the tackle position. I don't know if you're just wanting to throw Caden Green in there. I don't know how far he is along right now in the preseason. Five, six practices in. Uh, you know, Caleb Schaefer's certainly an option. Troy Everett's certainly an option. And as you mentioned, Jake Taylor. Yeah, no, I, I think that you go down the line and, and I, I think they feel really good about their talent, right? You talk about a Caden Green who looks great out there. Jacob Sexton, uh, you didn't mention him. He's a guy that I think that probably would be the starting left tackle if he didn't get hurt in the bowl game. Maybe they don't take a Walter Rouse, but to get a Walter Rouse that has a lot of experience, I think is going to help them. But I think they have some talent. It's just guys haven't played, right? I mean, even a Troy Everett comes in, and I think they really like him. But he only played, I think, six or seven games last year for Appalachian State. So where does he fit in the mix? I think they've got a bunch of guys that they're probably about a year away. And you, like you said, there's going to be injuries. That's going to happen this season. Who are those guys that they think that they can rely on to come in the game? Is it a true freshman in Caden Green? Is it a Jacob Sexton? Jake Taylor, I think, is having a really good fall camp. Is he somebody that can maybe even push for a starting job, right? Um, I think that... They feel good about the talent they have. They just don't know until they get in a game. And it's so hard, right, because they only get so many padded practices. So I'm sure Bill Beatonbo doesn't really know what he has until some of those guys get to actually play in some action. And that's why I think those early games, especially early in the season in Arkansas State, Tulsa, you're going to see them play a lot of those guys to see what they got. You know, that's it's, it's just crazy how college football works because you're right. Like, if Jacob Sexton doesn't go down in the pregame of – uh, the cheese at bowl. Yeah. Do they even go after a Walter Rouse? Is Walter Rouse playing at Nebraska right now? Yeah. It's it's crazy how all that kind of works, and especially in today's age of the transfer portal. One thing that we do know, and it's kind of been the I think one of the biggest talking points on the defensive side of the ball right now, uh, or through this first portion of preseason practice, has been the idea that defensive line. We talked about it on the official forty. They're bigger. There's yeah. no doubt about it. One of the guys that. I think sticks out more than anybody is Rondell Bothroyd and what he's bringing to Oklahoma via the transfer portal from Wake Forest. We did talk to Rondell on Monday. Here he is. In our depth, our depth is crazy. I think we have depth probably top up there in the top top in the country. And just the way we, <clears throat> the way we pay attention to details, um, Coach Davis, Coach Bates, they demand the best out of us every day, regardless of how you feel, regardless of what's going on. Um, so I think we just we're relentless and our depth is probably the one thing I would say. 
we've talked about it. There are many, many guys that could be getting snaps at some point during the season on the defensive line, whether it be outside of defensive end or inside. And that's kind of particularly where I'm most interested in is what they're going to do on the inside with Jonah Lulu moving inside. It, it seems like it's a massive positive right now for Miguel Chavis at the end position as well as Todd Bates. They just got a lot of guys. And you heard Rondell just talk about it, right? They, they have so many guys that have some experience and also just young guys that they think can be contributors. I mean, I, I think that Rondell is a guy from a down to down basis, play to play basis. He might have the biggest impact of anybody they got in the portal. I mean, last year, their biggest issue on defense was they couldn't set the edge. And a lot of teams were running at uh, those guys on the edge. They weren't able to set it. And, you know, they weren't able to get after the passer. And that's where those edge guys come into play. Rondell's really good at that, and he's played a ton of college football at a high level. Um, you know, he, Wake Forest is a good program. Um, you know, they 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 were a good football team a year ago, and so I think that he's a guy that can come in and, and be a day one starter and really contribute. And then you look at some of the other guys, and Ethan Downs, who's played some football now. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what is Reggie Grimes's role. He played sure. a ton of football last year. Here's a name for you. I've heard Trace Ford's had a really too. really good camp. It, now, but that's one of those situations that. He just has to stay healthy. And I think yep. that in the back of everybody's mind, you go, well, he's had two knee injuries. How long? It's almost kind of waiting for the bad to happen with Trace. And I know that there's nobody cheering for that, but it sounds like through five, six practices, they really like what they have in Trace Ford. Well, and here's the luxury that they have now with somebody like Trace is they have other guys they can rotate in. And so if you want to hold Trace out and be be cautious with him and only play him in certain situations or only play him a certain amount of snaps per game, you can do that because you have guys that you feel comfortable coming in if Trace is, is a little bit banged up or you just, again, want to try and keep him healthy and keep him limited uh, in how many snaps he plays. I mean, think about a P.J. Atabare. I mean, he's another guy that uh, he looks the part. I've heard he's had a really good fall camp. I think he can play. We haven't mentioned our Mason Thomas, and we talked a little bit about it on the unofficial 40, but we saw him walk out with a boot on after practice on Tuesday. So we'll see where that's at. I don't think it's anything too serious, but we don't really know yet. We just saw him with a boot on. Um, but he's another guy that, if he's healthy, I think can can contribute. So just think about all the guys we just mentioned. They have bodies there, whereas last year they just didn't. And then you mentioned the interior, and that's where it gets really interesting. And, and you and I have talked about it a lot, but... They, they have maybe eight or nine guys right now trying to fight for six spots, and I think that they feel really good. They've got Isaiah Coe, Jordan Kelly, two guys that have played a lot of football, have been here I think six years now, going on five, six years in the program. You bring in a Terry. We've talked a ton about him. Phil Paya. He's a big dude. Can he can he contribute? I just Mont don't know Sears. what's realistic with and sorry to cut you off. No, I just don't ahead. know right now what's realistic with Paya just because yeah. of the knee injury and like how long is it going to take to get him back out on the field. Yeah, and we haven't seen him a ton out there. I mean, he was at practice, obviously, but we just haven't seen him play a ton. Like, there's no film to go and watch, whereas a Terry, you can go back and you can watch Tennessee's game and say, oh, wow, he was he was productive in that game. You just look at him physically and you say, okay, well, if, if he's healthy, he looks like somebody that can, that can play. But they, again, that, it's another spot that... A year ago, they didn't have the options, right? They had a Jeffrey Johnson and Jalen Redmond, and and they were they were fine players. And Jalen had his injury history, and um, Jeffrey Johnson was an okay player. But it feels like they just got bigger up front, and they just have more bodies. You look at that group just in practice, and there's just more guys there than they had a year ago. It's very, very. Uh, it's one of the first things that jumps off the yep. table at you when you go out to practice. Is you go, you look at the defensive line, and I spent a good amount of time with them on uh, Monday when we went out there. It just starting to look like what you would expect an Oklahoma defense yeah. up front to look like. Yeah, and I, you know, and you look at what they're doing in recruiting. It's very clear that's a point of emphasis is the defensive line, and that's that's where you win football games. I mean, that's what we've talked about for years now with Oklahoma. They have been able to win in the trenches, especially on defense up front, and so I think that that's where the emphasis is. And and again, you saw it in the portal. They took more players up front on defense than any other position uh, on the team in the transfer portal. So I I, I, I believe that's going to continue going forward. And, and I do think it's going to get better because like I said, you're going from playing and I don't want to just, you know, crap on guys from last year, right. but you know, you're going from playing a Jeffrey Johnson to a Dejon Terry and that's an upgrade, right? That's an upgrade at that position. And I think that those small things can make a world of difference. And when you have so many bodies up front that you can rotate and have the depth that they have, uh, it's only going to benefit them, especially in those late fourth quarter games. Speaking of defensive line, 
Williams Winaria, obviously his announcement coming up on Monday, August 14th. You got David Stone uh, at the back end of the month on August 26th, I believe. And yep. that's something that Josh McQuishan hit on during the unofficial 40 podcast this week. As for, let's go to defensive back. Yeah. We talked to Woody Washington. He's, you know, the projected starter at one of the cornerback spots. I think that, you know, that other cornerback spot, I we're both really high on Gentry Williams. Mm -hmm. One of the names that keeps coming up time and time again is Isaiah, uh, just, just Josiah Wagner. Yeah. He's, I look, he had a great spring. He was somebody that he got first team reps in the spring. And, and some of that was Gentry was out. Remember he had his episode with, with, you know, the workouts and all that. So, you know, he, Josiah had, some uh more opportunities right so he's a guy that i think can play uh and and you look back at last year look how many guys they rotated till they finally landed on cj colden about halfway through the year to be that other starting corner opposite of woody and, and again you have injuries throughout a year there's probably going to be a game where maybe woody can't go or gentry or uh kindle dolby's a name that we haven't talked a ton about i think he's a guy that compete that can compete for that starting spot but yeah, Josiah Wagner, in terms of true freshmen that can help contribute, he seems to be high on the list. I know uh, Jay Valai loved him. Uh, he was a guy that talked a lot about him at the local media day. And then Woody Washington, I think, called him a pit bull the other day after practice. So. Here is Woody Washington talking about freshman Josiah Wagner. Uh, I think uh, I think Josiah's a pit bull. Like, whenever the ball comes his way, he's, he's going to get it. And, uh, He's like violent at the point of attack. So like I said, he's just a he's just a dog. He's a pit bull. You can see it uh, not only in practice but in the film room. He's competing to make sure that when when coach asks questions, he's answering it first and uh, just doing things like that. You know, talking to Jay Valai at uh, local media day, their toughness and physicality. Yep. That's what he's looking for in a cornerback. And you know, Josiah Wagner kind of fits that role. And especially hearing what Woody just said about him, it. It's kind of exciting. I think that there are so many guys, and we'll talk about safety here in later on shows just as far as what that's developing. I know that we hit on it a little bit on Monday. Uh, it sounds like Reggie Pearson's having a really good camp, as well as Key Lawrence, who I think, uh, you know, somebody, we, we kind of forget about Key Lawrence coming back to Oklahoma uh, th for this season. So that's kind of where everything is at as we stand. Uh, Oklahoma wrapping up their first padded practice on Wednesday. Uh, you know, let's go off the football field for a second to close out the show. 2024 non-conference schedule. I think that it sounds like there could be some movement there. Yeah, I expect them to announce that probably by the end of this week. Um, you know, I, I would maybe anticipate by Friday, uh, maybe Saturday or the weekend. Um, you know, I think they're down to... I, I've I've reported this a few times. I think it's going to be somewhere between Rutgers, NC State, Duke, uh, and Houston. Those are the four schools that have openings, uh, and they're also based off the other schools that had openings that I was told that are not it. So um, if I had to guess, it's one of those four. There could be a total curveball, right? Um, who you never know. Some teams can get out of their other contracts, and so maybe we get a different one. But I I, I have been informed that we should have some sort of uh, announcement on that. Because they have actually two openings um, in 2024, and I believe both will be announced by the end of the week. Yeah, that was something I was going to ask you, because remember, we're talking about 2024. So the SEC schedule is in place. The home schedule as it stands now, Tulane, Temple are your non-conference games. Mm -hmm. And then you have Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina, and then Texas, which is the neutral site game at the Cotton Bowl. I think if you're watching this, you probably well aware. But... You're looking for two games yep. because you're going to probably schedule. You have to meet the SEC criteria of a Power Five Opponent, conference, yep. which you just said: Rutgers, NC State, Duke, Houston. I, you know, and we think that that's going to be on the road, correct? I think so, but we don't. I mean, you, we don't you just really never know. know because I mean, you could also if if the other opponent is a, a group of five, and let's say it's uh, an SMU, and they could go to Dallas and play. SMU on the road, and I think they'd be fine with that. Or um, obviously, they're, I mean, they're not going to go to Tulsa. But for example, a group of five school, I don't think they'd mind going on a road trip for that. And then you get another power five school at home. So I don't really know for sure. I'm trying to find that out. But all I know is I think we're going to have an announcement very soon. And I know you also want to dive into I think we're going to have another big announcement next week on Tuesday. Yeah, I get into that. I don't know if anybody's heard, but we've been trying to get Lindsay Street open back up for the longest of time. I, it feels like the longest of time. It's been basically about a year. But maybe those campaign efforts are coming to fruition? I have been told by the university, and this is a direct statement from the university, that there will be, uh, I think the, the line they used, expansion and updated policies uh, coming on Tuesday 
and I there's rumblings, maybe some Lindsay Street um, opening back up. We'll see. Uh, I know Eddie's been working on that for years now. Yeah. I think I think it's been I think it was 2016 or 2017 that they stopped tailgating on Lindsay. Obviously, they opened those dorms over there. Um, it sounds like maybe. I'm not going to say definitively, but maybe there's a chance that that opens back up or at least somewhere on campus is going to be uh, more open on tailgating, I which think is going to be great. Regardless of what happens, it, you know, the, the Lindsay Street stuff kind of started out as a bit a little bit, yeah. but I think it did take on a life of its own just in terms of you're making the move to the SEC. You have to improve the game day atmosphere. Yeah. And, you know, I, I asked Joe Harris, it really kicked off back in June um, at the Board of Regents meeting where... There was an agenda item that said updating tailgating policies. And I asked President Joe Harris about it and he left the door open to, to opening up Lindsay Street again and, and basically said, hey, we're going to the going to the SEC in 2024 and we have to be uh, more on par with some of those schools. I mean, you talk about an Oxford, a Baton Rouge, some of the places Oklahoma is going to be traveling next year. Their tailgating scenes are some of the best in the country and Oklahoma knows they have to improve there. And, and President Joe Harris talked about that and basically said, yeah, we, we know we need to get better. And so the fact that the university is admitting that we'll see what it looks like, right? Maybe it's one of those situations where you got to pay a ton of money to tailgate on Lindsay. But the fact that the university is at least acknowledging it for the first time in several years, I think is a step in the right direction. Well, and it's something that they've realized for a while now. Yeah. And I, I, I even think I remember last year that they were sending like advanced crews out to SEC stadiums just to get a vibe of what they're doing on their yeah. game day. So it's a positive. If you're interested in getting any of the gear behind us, we have plenty of uh, Make Lindsay Street Great Again shirts. Go to Soonerscoopstore.com where you have them up here at the office. We'll get those shipped out as well as 25% off annual membership to Soonerscoop.com. That is with the On3 uh, brand, obviously. I just had to fit one in just for funsies. Sooner25, promo code Sooner. 25 for 25 percent off of an annual membership to soonerscoop.com and as you said i mean we're 24 days away i was kind of yep. joking with you before we started it feels like football is here and they're out of practice good news but you're still 24 days away yeah and you know it, it's it's gonna be fun because i think that the first few practices we're asking these guys who's standing out and they're like well no one yet and i think starting next week maybe we'll start you know hearing about guys uh, starting to emerge in some of those position battles, right? Who's going to win that linebacker job? Who's stepping up at re receiver? Who's making those plays? Um, and again, some of that's going to go into the season, but man, are we, we're close. And also, I mean, we got you know some big commitments coming up that I know Josh is on top of, so you're definitely going to want to subscribe um, for those. Uh, you, you mentioned Winery coming up on the 14th. You got David Stone on the 26th. I believe Nigel Smith is coming up in September. Sep early September. Uh, locally here, OKC Millwood, 2025 wide yep. receiver. Jay Nickens is going to make his announcement, I believe, coming up on Saturday. Yep. Caden Durham's coming up on Thursday. You know, we'll see. Listen to more of the unofficial 40 as Josh kind of breaks down the running back situation uh, for Oklahoma, at least on the recruiting trail. So I think that that's about it. Yep. it. It's a good time of the year. It seems like Norman's starting to get a little bit more busier as, uh, you know, people move back. Uh, you know, I think Rush is starting here in a couple of weeks. So a couple of frat laps here and there to maybe check out the scene. Yeah. For George Stoya, I'm Eddie Radosovich from the Soonerscoop.com studios. We'll talk to you next time.